Well, good morning, Bridgeway. How is everybody? It's good to see everybody out there. Now, we're having a family worship this morning, so the kids are going to join us in here today. Uh, it's good to be back. We had a great vacation. My family and I were out at the beach, and uh, so I'm refreshed. Still have sand in my toes, maybe. I don't know. Uh, but I'm glad to be back. We're going to start as we normally do with some worship. So would you stand? Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll, I'll fly away and I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away when I die. have gone out I'll fly away like a bird from prison bars have flown out I'll fly away yeah. and I'll fly away oh glory I'll fly away in the morning when I die hallelujah by and by I'll, I'll fly away Oh, how glad and happy when we meet I'll, I'll fly away No more cold iron shackles on my feet I'll, I'll fly away And oh And just a few more weary days in there now I'll fly away To a land where joy shall never end now I'll fly away of course And I'll fly away Oh glory I'll fly away in the morning When I die Hallelujah by and by Away. And I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away in the morning when I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll, I'll fly away. All right, well, you guys may have a seat. Well, good morning. It's good to see everybody. Welcome to Bridgeway. I'm glad to be back. Feeling much better. A uh, couple quick announcements. If you're visiting with us for the very first time, if you wouldn't mind to fill out a little bit about yourself in our communication card or just scan the QR code in front of you, and then we'll donate $10 to a Child's Hope International on your behalf. That $10 feeds a child for an entire month. Nursing home ministries coming up uh, right after uh, this afternoon at 1.30. So if you're interested in that, uh, just show up. We have teams, but uh, show up and uh, check that out. Pool party. So we're still having this. It is today at 12.30 at my house. The rain's supposed to be over. It might be a little cool, but, you know, the kids don't care. They'll swim anyway. I'm not going to swim now, but, you know, we'll see what the rest of them do. But we're going to have pizza for them. And uh, we'll have everything covered for them, okay? Just show up at 1230. Um, I sent my address to the parents. If you didn't get it for some reason, let me know. But that is still today uh, at 1230 at my house. Grace Ready Fest. So if you haven't brought your markers, really tomorrow is going to be the last day for you to do that. Uh, we, we take all the markers to the help center on Tuesday. That way they get all the supplies set up. And then Saturday is the Ready Fest. If you don't even know what this is, we participate with about 10 other churches to help about 400 families get ready for school. 
who maybe can't afford it. So uh, we'll have a team going up there. Mike Storch is going to lead that team. So if you're interested in helping on Saturday, get with Mike Storch. Um, Jackie's going to head up face painting that Saturday as well. So that's all going to be downtown Batavia this Saturday. So if you're interested, talk to them or talk to myself. Small groups are going to start back up here in a few weeks. There's uh, a specific small group, if you want to check it out, called Following Christ 101. And uh, that's just the basics of uh, Christianity. So if you want to learn some foundational teaching, sign up for that. And then the Grandparent Conference is coming up. So grandparents, this is really to help equip you in uh, discipling your grandchildren and just getting more tools in your toolbox for the role that you play in your family's life. So um, you, you're, you're gonna learn some new things if you go to it, that's what I'm gonna guarantee. If you're interested, let me know, sign up on the communication card or just talk to me personally and uh, we'll let the church know. Family camp's coming up also, so that's at Woodland Lakes uh, Family Camp. If you haven't signed up for that, please do so. Um, we're going to go to prayer, and we're going to be praying uh, specifically this morning for the folks in Kentucky. I'm sure you've seen where there's just been devastating flooding down there. Uh, I've reached out to our associational director to see like what contacts we have down there, just to see what, what we could do to help. I don't know what that looks like yet, so I'm waiting to get word. And as soon as I know, you know what they need from us, uh, we'll help out. Maybe... We might even send a team down there once the waters subside to clean things up. I don't know what it looks like, but I, I feel like we need to do something. Um, and so uh, let's be praying for those folks. I think 25 people have lost their life. Um, this, it's just devastating. So we want to lift those folks up today. So let's bow together in prayer. Let's think about those folks. Think about their families and the, the hardship that they're experiencing right now. Lift them up to the Lord. God, we come to you today and we are grateful for your presence in our life. And we know that in this life there is hardship, there is uh, challenges, there is suffering. And sometimes this just comes out of nowhere and uh, it's part of living in a fallen world. But we know it, it, it can bring just great suffering upon people. And folks in Kentucky are feeling this right now. I pray for the families who've lost loved ones, uh, in particular a family who lost four children. Uh, God, we pray for, for them as they grieve and they mourn. May they know your presence in their life. Some have lost businesses, means of income. So we lift those folks up to you and we pray for our, ourselves, Lord, as we figure out what we can do to help down there and be the hands and feet of Christ. We pray for the local churches down in that area as well as uh, no doubt they're mobilizing, figuring out what they can do to help out. So we lift those folks up to you today, God, and we ask for your help in that, that situation. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Let's stand together and we'll sing a few more songs this morning. Well, I'd like to invite the kids on up today. We're going to do a kid's song. So Come, on Come on down. I'll move this out of the way. Come on up right here on the rug. I need the kids oh, on don't be stage. bashful. Come on down. We got more kids than that. that like we got a men's trio Come right on. now is what we got. Someone being bashful today. Well, while they're coming, I just want to say I'm thankful for Saren <laughs> being here today. The boys got it. We oh, we got some girls coming on. All right, come on down. With sickness and vacations, and so I thought I was going to be the only one up here today. So thankfully, Aaron's here, and now I'm joined by the kids. So well, we're going to sing Pharaoh, Pharaoh. It sounds like Louie Louie, but that's copyrighted. This isn't Louie Louie. This is Pharaoh, Pharaoh. Does anybody know the movements to this song? There are movements. If you know them, come on down. All right.
Here we go. I said, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, oh, baby, let my people go. Huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. I said, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, oh, baby, let my people go. Huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, the burning birds told me just the other day I said, come over. And get my people out of Pharaoh's hand And lead them on over to the promised land I said, Pharaoh, Pharaoh Oh, baby, let my people go huh. Yeah, 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 yeah I said, Pharaoh, Pharaoh Oh, baby, let my people go huh. Yeah, 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 yeah I see some people know the, uh Emotions out there, Teresa Christ, holding out on me. But all God's people, all God's people came to the Red Sea. The Pharaoh's army coming after me. I raised my rod, stuck it in the sand. All of God's people walked across dry land. I said, Pharaoh, Pharaoh. Teresa Christ, you're in charge of teaching the emotions next time, all right? All right, you guys can go ahead and have a seat, kiddo. And adults, you can all have a seat. Pride to you we 
the book of Galatians, and uh, we'll be in chapter 5. We're going to continue our series in the book of Galatians, and then next week, Tommy Webb's going to be preaching. I'm not getting sick next week ahead of time, okay? So uh, our men's group earlier in the year, we wanted to, to do something hard, um, and so we decided we would try a Tough mutter. and none of us have trained for it, so it's going to be really hard. Uh, and that's next weekend. So uh, pray for us, because we may not be sick, but we might be injured next Sunday. We'll find out how that goes. But um, Tom's going to be preaching next Sunday. Looking forward to hearing him. And so we're going to be back in chapter 5. And uh, I know you're probably like, okay, Brent, we've, we, we get Paul's point. He's said over and over again, we don't live under the law anymore. And you're probably kind of sick of hearing about that. And uh, I could understand that. He just, Paul is passionate about making this point over and over again. And what he's going to do now, moving forward, for the most part, he's going to deal with the practical side of this issue. And it is really answering the question of, if we don't live by the law, then how should we live? And that's really the question he's going to answer in the following text uh, for the next several weeks. So chapter 5, verse 13 is where we'll, we'll start. For you are called to be free, brothers and sisters. Only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. For the whole law is fulfilled in one statement, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out, or you will be consumed by one another. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the reading of your word today. We thank you that your word still speaks, that it is sharp and is powerful, Lord, that it can teach us, guide us, mold us, and so help us to yield to what you have to say today. We pray this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. So the, the Galatians, like some churches even today, were confused by this issue of law and grace. And if you don't know what the law is, it's talking about the law of Moses. And uh, in fact, like Seventh-day Adventists struggle with this, where they have the law and they have, uh, mo it's hilarious, I know. <laughs> we have more kids in here today than normal, which is fine. You're going to hear noises and we don't mind the noise, right? Because a quiet church would be a dead church. You know what I mean? So we can have crying, we can have laughing, and we can have all sorts of stuff. That's fine. It's the fifth Sunday, so we wanted to have the kids in here because here's part of the reasoning behind it is kids often go to kids' church and it is an easier learning environment. Like, I don't expect your four-year-old to understand the law of Moses and grace today, okay? They're not gonna be picking up what I'm throwing out. But... I want them to experience the worship experience with their mom and dad, too. You know what I mean? So they'll still have those memories. I remember being a little kid at Bells Lane Baptist Church, laying in the pew, bored out of my mind, at like five years old, sitting next to my mom during church. And I'm like, why are we even in here? But I remember my parents making priority that, hey, we worship together. And so we want to make sure that our little ones also get to experience that as well. So that's why they're in here today, with it being Fifth Sunday or kids workers have the day off. So that's where we're at. Uh, let's go back here to the question here of this law and grace. So if we're not under law, how, what, what are we under? Are we lawless people? Um, and so they're asking Paul, well, okay, well, how are we supposed to live then? If I don't have all these rules to guide me in everyday life, what am I supposed to do, Paul? Are we lawless? And so <clears throat> Paul answers it in verse 16. He says, I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desire of the flesh. So it's like, you don't have all these rules, just walk in the Spirit. So the question then becomes, okay, well, how do I walk in the Spirit then? What does that look like? That's what we're going to try to unpack a little bit today. If you go back to verse 13, he alludes to it. He says, for you were called to be free. Brothers and sisters, only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. He's like, you're free from the condemnation of the law of Moses. Remember, the law, all it does is it shows us our need for a Savior. And Paul describes them as free people. John 8, Jesus said, so if the Son sets you free, you really will be free. But what is this, this freedom that we have? Does it mean we can go and do whatever we want? No. And that's the, Paul, that's the point Paul's gonna make in these, this chapter uh, moving forward. This is not meant that you're set free to do whatever you want. It would be, you know, if you think coming to Jesus and then I can do whatever I want and leave a hedonistic lifestyle, you, you don't want Christianity. Because when we come to Jesus, he changes us from the inside out. And we're not free to do whatever we want. We are free to live as God designed us to live. And so there will be a change that takes place in us. Notice what he says this. Don't use this, brothers and sisters, as an opportunity or an excuse for your flesh. Like if you think I can get saved and then I can really do what I want because boom, I've got my fire insurance. You're not viewing the gospel the way the gospel is actually presented. You come to Jesus and you get Jesus. The reason we get heaven is because we have a relationship with Jesus in this life. That relationship doesn't end. It extends into the life that is to come. In fact, the reason we desire heaven is because Jesus is there. And we will see him face to face one day. For the whole law is fulfilled in one statement. Love your neighbor as yourself. He makes one more shot at legalism before moving forward. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out, or you will be consumed by one another. That's kind of graphic. He takes one shot at legalism, saying, hey, an environment of legalism does not foster love. It fosters a critical eye. Where you're zeroing in on are people screwing up? Are they not holding the line? And if you've ever been in a legalistic church, you know what I'm talking about. 
You've got these standards, whether they're said or they're unsaid. There's critical eyes of people pointing out how other people are screwing up. And in my Christian life, I've seen way too much friendly fire take place, right? Sometimes Christians are really good at shooting their own because that spirit of legalism is you're looking for a critical eye for people when they screw up and when they do screw up, you pounce. Or you've got silly rules that we've talked about before. And sometimes it's just subtle, just silly stuff. Like I was at uh, church camp years ago and uh, I was one of the preacher boys and uh, I, I was um, working the sound system and our guest speaker, we always had the same speaker come every year. He's a good guy, um, does a, did, did, did a great job. We just, you know, if we were talking today, we would disagree on some things, but he's allowed to be wrong, you know. But um, <laughs> I remember sitting back there and I've got my, my, my khakis and my, my button-up shirt for church for church camp. And he comes back to the sound booth, gets all over me because I'm a preacher boy. And why aren't you dressed in your suit and tie kind of thing for, for church camp, you know? And that's just subtle. But I'm thinking, I'm looking back on that like, that's just a silly rule. Like, if you want to dress up, that's fine. I don't care. It's up to you. We've had this conversation probably way too many times. I don't care what you wear to church. Clothing is required. <laughs> what type of clothing? I don't care. But have you ever been at church where they destroy their own? As Paul would say here, they bite and devour one another. And he says, watch out. You'll be consumed by one another. So what, what spirit does he want them to have? He says, serve one another through love. That's what he wants them to do. At the end of verse 13, that's what he says. He says, hey, love your neighbor as yourself in verse 14. What does that look like? Can he wants them to be led by the spirit. Not all these rules necessarily. So what that would look like in a, let's just take the church setting, is when someone screws up, you help them out. Instead of being quick to be critical of that person, try to understand what's happening, why it's happening, and get down in the dirt and help them up. Because it could be you at any point in time that's down, right? But by the grace of God, there goes I. And within a faith family context, you should be able to share some crap going on in your life or the fact that you've screwed up and those people seek to help you. Now, that doesn't mean, I mean, accountability does at times mean people we love are gonna say, hey, you're in the wrong. But they're doing it from a posture of love, not from a critical eye. So Paul wants them to foster an environment where they're showing grace to one another. They're building one another up. And they feel okay saying, hey, I need help. That's one of the one things I love about our men's group, which it starts back towards the end of uh, August. In fact, uh, our first meeting, um, last year, our first meeting, we had uh, barbecue. And so in the spirit of doing things the same, we're gonna have barbecue again, except this time we're gonna shoot guns in the process. Maybe not at the same time while we're eating and shooting, although some guys might try that. Uh, but that's on the 21st. We're gonna have uh, some barbecue and shoot clays at my house. But one thing I appreciate about our men's group is when we talk downstairs on those Wednesday nights, first of all, whatever we talk about stays down there. And we got guys opening up, talking about things going on in their life. And without any of us seeking to beat one another up, but to, to lift each other up, to help one another. Because the reality is there's not many spaces in society for men to sit down and say, I'm not okay. It doesn't really exist in society. And so if you're a man and you just want some community with other men, then come shoot guns with us, eat some barbecue, and then be a regular when we meet. Because you're gonna find a group of men who love Jesus 
and are trying their best to lead their homes, lead themselves, and be leaders in their church. So that's just my little advertisement there, uh, fellas. Um, back to this, okay, how do we live? Paul's critics could not grasp how people could operate without the law. Remember, Paul's critics were the Judaizers. They were saying, yeah, you need Jesus, but you need the law. They could not fathom the, these new Christians functioning without the law. So the question is, okay, well, how will they know how to live? That's what they wanted to know. If we look at Romans 8, there is a law that we are under. Romans 8, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, because the law of the spirit of Christ, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. 1 Corinthians 9, for the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, like one under the law though I myself, Paul is saying, am not under the law, to win those under the law. To those who are without the law, like one without the law, though I am not without God's law, but under the law of Christ, to win those without the law. That's like a lot of laws in there. Do you know what I mean? But what his point is, he says, there is this law that we have as Christians. It's not the law of Moses. He says it's the law of the Spirit of Christ. What, what exactly is that? The law of Moses was external. It was given to on the outside, and it, that's how it operated. The Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, operates from the internal. God in you. John 14. If you love me, you will keep my commands. This is Jesus talking. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He is the Spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him. But you do know him because he remains with you and will be in you. And this was talked about back in Jeremiah, chapter 31. It says, look, the days are coming. This is the Lord's declaration when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Instead, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, the Lord's declaration. I will put my teaching within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will one teach his neighbor or his brother saying, know the Lord for they will all know me from the least to the greatest of them. This is the Lord's declaration for I will forgive their iniquity and never again remember their sin. And that comes to fruition and the Holy Spirit and dwelling believers. Didn't always work like that. Not until we get to the New Testament, the death and resurrection of Christ, and the Holy Spirit now dwells in mankind. If you are a Christian, God's Spirit dwells in you. I'm saved, I'm a believer, I'm a follower of Christ. The Holy Spirit is there to help guide me in this life. God didn't give you the Bible to answer every single question you would ever have or help you with every single decision you would ever have. The Bible's there so we can get to know God, but it doesn't speak to every subject on life. You won't look up in the Bible and it say, thou shalt not take that job or thou shalt not date that person. It's not in there. I mean, if, and if God was writing the Bible for every single decision we would ever make, the volume would be huge. But what we do have is the Holy Spirit indwelling us to give us direction, to convict us, to guide us, to do this, to not do this. You say, well, Brent, can't some people just kind of say it's the Holy Spirit when it's not? Yeah, we're gonna get to that. Because that's what the Judaizers would have been saying. Like, really? Can't some people just make stuff up and say it's from God? They can. But as a follower of Christ, you know what the conviction of the Holy Spirit feels like. You do. If you don't, then it might be that you're not a follower of Jesus. Jesus. But there, has there ever been that knocking of I need to do fill in the blank? 
or you're about to do something you shouldn't do, and there's that just, hey, stop. You know. You know you need, don't do it. As a follower of Christ, you know exactly the experience that I'm describing to you right now. The problem is we don't always listen. Ephesians 4.30 says, and don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. You were sealed by him for the day of redemption. We can grieve the Spirit of God. 1 Thessalonians 5, don't stifle the Spirit or quench the Spirit by just not listening. Because maybe you're thinking, well, Brent, I, I can't hear God. I don't have a desire for it like I once did. I feel as if that has just died off in me. Then you need to get real with God about some things. Philippians 2 says, For it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. I don't have the desire. Well, God works in me to cultivate that, to will, to desire. And so you may not feel like getting on your face and talking to God today about that. Do it anyway. Say, Lord, I don't desire you like I should. Break up this hard ground that shouldn't be there. Help me be sensitive to what you're saying, sensitive to your word and to your leading. Because it might just be God's been wanting to guide you in certain directions, but you're not listening. You've quenched the spirit or grieved the spirit. Romans 8 says this, for those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit have their minds set on things of the spirit. Now the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the spirit is life and peace. It's a mindset, it's something that you pursue, something that grows, this desire can grow, this mindset you, you set yourself to, for it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. It's not automatic. You got to put some effort. That's why often Paul talks about his, his faith journey like a race, or he'll talk about that he exercises himself for godliness because he knows your flesh doesn't want to do this. We've, got, we've been saved, we've been born again, we still got this old flesh here, and it battles against us. And Paul talks about this a lot, probably because he struggled with it too. So you need to embrace the challenge of it. Has it been a while, friend, as you've heard from God? It's not that he's not wanting to talk to you. It's not that his spirit isn't wanting to convict you. Perhaps maybe some priorities need to change in your life. I don't know what that looks like for you. I, I know you do. Because often, as a, I, I just think of like my own Christian walk. Because at the end of the day, I know I'm your pastor, but the only reason I'm up here is because God called me to do it. That's it. I, I'm a Christian. I, I struggle like you guys do, and I can look back on my Christian walk and, and some, some times where things seemed really apathetic, and I just didn't care like I should. And I can equate it, really, on simple terms, like Paul often equated it, it's, it's like exercise. When you start off, you don't want to do it. And even when you get going, there are times where we don't want to do it. It does get easier over time. But then you start seeing results, and there's motivation there. Build some rhythms in your day. Make an appointment with God and keep it. When it comes to your prayer, it comes to reading, you're not going to want to do it. <laughs> But God's gonna work in you. I promise you that. He said it. He's the one working in you to, to work on that desire and to do a good work in you. And he's not a liar, so he'll do it. 
Now, maybe you're like, okay, Brent, maybe there's a skeptical side of you to like, how do I know this whole Holy Spirit thing isn't just my conscience? You know, I mean, my conscience is my moral compass, and it tells me what to do and what not to do. How do I know that that's not the Holy Spirit, or how do I pan this out? Well, first thing I'd say about our conscience is that everyone is born with it. Everybody has a conscience. Feelings of guilt or anguish. Our conscience can be influenced by exterior things. Sometimes people have a weak conscience. Sometimes, the scripture even says this, uh, that your conscience can be seared. Where there are people who you would say they have zero conscience, they have zero moral compass. Because it's been seared. It's not that they don't have it, it's just been killed by whatever. Whereas the Spirit of God, not everybody's born with it. You've got to be born again. It's not influenced by outside forces because the Holy Spirit is, is God. It cannot be seared. He's always there. And it is more than just a moral awareness. Scripture says, if I hide his word in my heart, it's gonna keep me from sin. And I can think of many, many passages that pop in my brain from time to time. My conscience doesn't bring that into me. God's Spirit does. Or if I need a scripture of encouragement or a challenge, God's Spirit brings it to me. But here's the thing, you gotta read the Bible in order to, for those things to be brought to your memory. I've had God's Spirit comfort me. I've seen it comfort other people. I've seen his spirit counsel. See, I think sometimes it's easy to just get in such a rut that you feel like you can't experience that anymore. God is greater than the deadness of your desire. He'll break up that ground, I promise you. God's Spirit will never lead you to do something that's not scriptural. So the whole idea of someone saying, well, God told me to do it and it's something stupid, it wasn't God. Like, I, older pastors, when I talk to them, I like to hear their horror stories. I know that's kind of morbid, right? Like, what was your worst experience at a church? Um, but it's kind of like talking to an ER nurse. Like, Tell me the most disgusting thing you ever saw. And those are cool stories. Have you ever watched that uh, show, Untold Stories of the ER? Anybody with me on that? I love that show. There's some crazy stuff on it. <clears throat> so when I, I meet with older pastors, you know, they've been there, they've done that. They've got like this wellspring of wisdom and experiences that I can draw from. But I always want to start with like, what's one of the dumbest, craziest things anyone ever said to you? So I was sitting down with this pastor and I uh, asked him that question, and he went down a couple of them, but this one stuck out to me. He said, I, I sat down with this man in my office, and he told me God has been speaking to me, and God's been moving in my life. And the pastor's like, hey, that's awesome. He's like, I've concluded that God wants me to divorce my wife and marry my girlfriend. And the dude was dead serious. I'm like, surely this guy's just messing with you. And he goes, psych, at the end. That's a 90s term, kids. Uh, like, hey, it's just a joke. But no, the guy's dead serious. He's like, that, that ain't God, dude. God didn't tell you to do that. And so if you think you can blame God for some stupidity that you decided to do, um, not God's fault. Sometimes I think the Lord gets a bad rap because people claiming he told him to do stuff that he's like, oh, I didn't tell him to do that. 
Paul's going to make that more obvious in the upcoming verses. God's never going, his Spirit's never going to lead you to do something that's contrary to what he's given in his word. So if you think, okay, Brent, maybe this isn't right, go to the word, see what he says. The Spirit teaches us when we read the word. Find out what he's saying. Follow the Spirit. He's in you. He'll cultivate that desire. And he still speaks. Let's pray. Let's bow together. Kids, you did great in here today. You guys did really good. Uh, let's take a moment. <clears throat> As I've said, I know when I look back at my, my walk with Christ, it has not always been what it should be. And I'm thankful that God's Spirit convicts me of that. Like when that desire has been dead, that, the Spirit's still there like, hey, you're... <laughs> You gotta get some stuff going, man. You need to get some things together. And so maybe that's you this morning. You said, Brian, my desire for God is not anywhere what it should be. And I don't even desire to pray to ask about it. Do it. Do it anyway. Make the effort. Brian, I don't, I don't wanna read the word. Get in the word. Take time to pray. There's old song that says, when you don't feel like praying, Pray. That would be my encouragement to you. And allow God to cultivate some things going in, in your life. And then when he speaks, you're gonna know it, Christian. Listen to what he has to say. God of the universe dwells in me and dwells in you. It's a huge thought. God, we come to you today. What an amazing thing to consider. Your spirit dwells within us. I don't even know how all that works, Lord. I know it's true, though. I've experienced it. I know it. God, there are probably some people in this room or watching online that don't know that because they've not yielded themselves to you. They've not turned to Christ for the forgiveness of their sin. I pray for those folks, Lord, that they'd come to a saving faith in Christ. They turn from their sin. They trust in the one who died for them and resurrected for them. I pray for the Christian in this room. Maybe they've been Christian for a little bit of time or a long time, and that desire isn't what it used to be. It isn't what it should be. I pray they make it the, the, the number one priority of their life to make the effort to cultivate that along with your Holy Spirit. The Judaizers, Lord, were thinking, we need someone, we need all these rules to, to guide these people, but your Spirit is in us to convict us, to guide us. And that's our reality. We need to live in light of that. We pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. We're gonna stand and sing. If you got questions about faith, Christ, God, I'll be out in the lobby. I'd love to talk to you. All right, we're gonna head out of here on a high note today. We're gonna go back to a... Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll, oh, I'll fly away. Yes, I'll fly away. Oh, glory, I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll, I'll fly away. Chorus. Yes, I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll, I'll fly away. 
Amen. You guys are dismissed. Have a wonderful week.